You are indeed watching Breakthrough News, and this is the Freedom Side Live. I am one of your hosts, Eugene Perrier, here as always, alongside my co-host, Rania Kalik. Rania, hello. Hello, Eugene. It's good to be back with a bit it's of a always, different backdrop. <laughs> you, well, I wasn't going to say anything, but it's a nice looking backdrop that you have there. I like yeah. that you're sort of switching it up for our viewers, you know, giving people a new look. Exactly. It's important. Variety. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good to have variety. It is the spice of life. And we've got a lot of variety for you here on the show. We're going to be talking, well, maybe this is not that variety from the past few weeks. We'll be talking about Ukraine, some of the fallout from everything that's happening there, the possibility of peace talks, what's going on vis-a-vis -vis the sanctions. We're going to talk specifically about China and many of the things circling around China's involvement in this overall crisis and how it will affect it. We're also going to be talking about Colombia, where there is much more going on than the mainstream media in the West is telling you about for sure, but some big primary elections and some big upcoming elections and some other things happening there that are indicative of the state of a very important country in Latin America for what is a very important year in Latin America. And of course, we will be talking about hashtag the slap. Sh shaking the world <sighs> it's gone all around the world I, everyone's discussing it i have no idea what you're talking about <laughs> <laughs> what could you imagine <laughs> I, you know i i can't even imagine because i don't know if there's anyone anywhere on earth that hasn't heard about it uh or talked about it so we will get in with that uh you know look it's it's been a rough month or so two months so in terms of the news a lot of terrible tragic things happening so we wanted to at least start off today's show with a little bit of levity but of course before we do anything else we want to remind you to go ahead and hit that subscribe button on youtube also hit the bell so you get the alerts we have quite a bit coming out here on breakthrough news and shout out to everyone who's been supporting us and sharing our content but if you are new to breakthrough new to the breakthrough news youtube page make sure you hit subscribe make sure you hit that bell a lot of fantastic stuff not only has already come out but will continue to come out on ukraine and many many other important issues so you want to be subscribed and you want to make sure you're getting the alerts and don't forget if you want to if you so choose you can donate in the super chat and our sensor Rania Kalik will determine whether or not what you say is okay whether or not you can have your message read so again we don't know what the parameters are so I guess just do the best you can uh sanctions affecting you there Rania I can see uh, they are. This is I will fix amazing. it give me a minute no, actually leave it like this I love this no uh, I have to turn I have to turn I have I have it you look like you're in the Blair Witch like, Project guys. <laughs> I do I do should I just do the whole show like this this will just I mean, be one second <laughs> I love the Blair Witch Project that was a huge I don't know I'd love for people to post in the chat if they thought that was real when they first saw it I did. Uh, <laughs> it's a whole other story. Um, so yeah, we've got plenty for you here, plenty coming. You obviously can go to patreon.com slash breakthrough news and become a patron as well. If you want to support us, thank you for putting that down there. There we go. We got to just get Rania back. I don't want to go on with the show without her. I could, but that wouldn't be, that wouldn't be right. There we Our have fans it. Wouldn't like Hello. That. There you go. Welcome back. Rania. <laughs> Anything I'm you'd sorry, like to share with us in your time in the dark? Yeah, I just, uh, woof, you know, it was it was a rough time, but I made it back. I almost didn't find my way. <laughs> <laughs> you really did look like the no, it's, it's, project. It really is incredible, man. This is the this is what happens when you live in a sanctioned country. Sometimes the lights just go out. Yeah. Well, if they're not on. careful, and people in Germany and <laughs> it might be having the same thing happen sometime soon. Right, but right, we'll get to the right. impact of sanctions on Europe and the rest of the world. Yeah. But right now, we want to turn to the slap, slap heard round the world. Really amazing that this happened. Very, very honored to be joined as we continue the show by good friend of the show, Sierra Taylor, popular educator, grassroots organizer, and artist. Sierra, welcome back to the Freedom Side. Oh, you're muted. Oh, no. We got those gremlins, those technological gremlins. <laughs> oh, I can't hear you. Nope, not yet. Okay, we're gonna right, we're gonna we're fix gonna it and there. bring it back. We're Those gonna make it. We're glasses. gonna fix it. Yeah. I like that you've she leaned into the gremlins on. thing. Yeah, I like that she just has to turn on her sanctions proof uh, lights, like I did. Like I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I actually read a, a great article 
the last year from South Africa from a journalist about the load shedding and he was just discussing the broader like all the middle class people in South Africa all the things that they've done to you know try to make sure their life doesn't seem any different but the power was out I yeah. guess for so long he was like my solar panels weren't oh, working no. my batteries were drained and like it, the whole thing oh, was a mediation on how poor and working class folks are experiencing such a different type of life with the concept of load shedding which there isn't because of sanctions unfortunately due to extreme mismanagement of the electrical grid but it is it was a very interesting conversation well, so about how Lebanon, people, the workarounds well Lebanon is both of those things too and I think that sort of mismanagement exists in a lot of uh countries that have like neoliberal rot if you will mm -hmm. um but yeah, I mean, it's like, yeah, middle class people do suffer from like inconveniences, like having to get up and like turn on your your little like generator. Um, but yeah. yeah, no, there are people who go all day without electricity. Like well, real quick, because I think we have it. Sierra Sometimes... back, but I I just have to say oh, this. Okay. By the way, Jim, shout out to you for your comment. But Lucille Bol Lucille Bollocks, also a great name in the super chat. Thank you for your donation. Habibi of Shadows, Ranya Witch Project Three. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I like that. Can we produce that? Can I think we can. I think we like, can. Okay. Breakthrough All right, films. We're on it. Thank you. For, <laughs> thank you for the donation. Yeah, that's. I think we back. have Sierra Taylor back with us. Hi. Can you hear me? Now we can hear you. Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. I was you. planning to talk about the Ukraine, but I guess the powers that be don't want that. So I guess we'll talk about the slap curd around the world. I mean, you know, if, it's what's allowed. Whatever, if, you, if you like to comment on Ukraine, I'm sure our listeners would be happy to hear it. Uh, I'd also like to see if you could tie in the two. That would be the real, the real uh, showstopper. But we did want to bring you in because you are such a great commentator on everything, but certainly the way uh, culture affects us all. I know you and I were talking during and after the slap you actually alerted me to the slap sierra uh and so you know it's honestly been over a week chris rock of course did a stand up last night in hollywood for those who didn't see it he did not mention it he started out he just said how was your weekend with a wink and everyone <laughs> laughed and then he just said i'll talk about it later but sierra i mean i i honestly don't even know where to start here i mean i i'd ask your take but there's so many different elements to it but i, I guess what was your first reaction i guess when you saw it and then uh texted me about it yeah i mean i think i told you my partner and i were having a debate as to whether or not it was real and if it really happened We've been watching the new edition of the Fresh Prince of Bel, Bel Air. Mm. And so we're like, all right, Will Smith's trying to come hard with the West Philly, like <laughs> rebrand. Um, but I, I had a feeling I was, I first thought, and I remember us texting about this, I first thought that it was a punch. And I was like, it couldn't have been a slap. That's way too disrespectful. And it turns out, <laughs> yeah, that disrespect <laughs> came in. Yeah, we, you know, one of the things. Go ahead. <laughs> Why is it more disrespectful? No, you go ahead. You go, go ahead, and then. Well, I mean, so I was just gonna say, like, I've luckily, you know, had so many people send me memes and you know, texts, and you know, God bless the internet. And I think that it's really, uh, you know, some of the comments that I've seen, it's just like really interesting how hardcore some of our people go. And they're just like, you know, what about, you know, the situation in Ukraine? What about, you know, we have 700 people dying a day of poverty. Like, why are we talking about this? This is a di distraction. And then we have this other group that's like, this is toxic masculinity and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, oh my gosh, like, can't we just have fun for a second? Like, can't we just, you know, enjoy this? Um, but just reminding, you know, myself that, as someone who's engaged in the movement and then sort of thinking about the mental terrain, not to forget that this is not our class that we're talking about. You know, both Will Smith and Chris Rocker of the class, you know, obviously West Philadelphia born and raised, but we're not talking about our class. And so for me, I'm just thinking about, you know, what expressions from our class are coming out about this? Like, where are people, like, what are people thinking about? Because it's not something that we can ignore which is why I'm so happy that, you know, you all have me on. 
Well, you know, it's funny you say that because I think in a way, I mean, isn't that why people like it? I mean, it's kind of like the Real Housewives and other shows that like, you know, the, we're, we're, the rich are so put up on a pedestal, you know, as the greatest people that seeing rich people do something like just just messy is somewhat enjoyable to people and seeing them have, you know, some sub sort of subset of problems or whatever. I mean, I, I don't have a deep theory behind this, but I've always felt that's why kind of like moments like these uh, speak to so many people because it is in a, in a way kind of puncturing that sense of like betterness that like they somehow were so much better than me that they were able to get to this stage in life um you know that we're sort of put out there like if you work hard you succeed and that's obviously always put out there every actor of course i was you know born underneath a picnic bench outside a trailer and here i am making 100 million dollar films you know it's it's so deeply baked into this sense of so-called meritocracy in the u.s it feels like Definitely. I, I definitely think so. And, you know, like one of those theories of poverty is around, you know, you did something wrong or by accident, you know, you're not a millionaire. I also think, and so I love the Real Housewives. Uh, shout out to, uh, what is it? Los Angeles, you know, Potomac, uh, Salt Lake City, Free Jenny. Um, but I've been watching all of these different, I don't know if you've seen like these different mini documentaries or different mini series about all of these wealthy scammers. I mean, you have, you know, home girl, you have the tender swindler, mm -hmm. you have you know, like just all these different Bad people vegan. who, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, who were able to make some sort of money and it's always interesting because when these folks do something wrong, one is like, we don't see the wealthy or the ruling class as violent. Not to say all these people are the ruling class, but they're definitely wealthy and you know detached from the working class. I think also we don't see the economic issues and exploitation as violence. So it's interesting, like when we hear a celebrity and it's like, oh, my God, or how could they, you know, rape this person or all they do is violence. Like it's all violence. Um, and it's difficult because obviously we live where we live and the time that we live in. And, you know, even myself, I'm grateful to be able to have comrades to sort of engage in these conversations because you do sort of re revert back. To, you know, um, your sort of natural way of thinking before you were sort of politicized. And for me, it's just, it's so many things. It's hard, you know, it's, it's very difficult uh, to talk about because it's just like, you know, don't cancel me, you know, left progressives, whoever you are. But it is hard. Like as a black woman, I do think about, um, you know, obviously we're not in the same times as chattel slavery, but I do think about black men not being able to protect black women. Um, mm -hmm. I do think, you know, like, oh, wow, here's this person sticking up for their partner. You know, obviously not in the way that, you know, we all can or all able to. Um, and it's also like, damn, Chris, like, sorry. You have so many women in the audience who shaved their heads that you could have pointed that to. Do you really have to pick the one woman who's been battling yeah. this disease out in public to make your DIJ? I mean, Tiffany Haddish. Come on. Yeah. She's probably yeah. starring in some weird remake of G.I. Jane. You know, like, I, I come on. <laughs> I mean... Those are all those are those are those are all good points. There was also like the reaction to it was was interesting as well because so many people weren't sure if it was real. Like, was this like a publicity stunt? And there was all these memes going around, like, oh, they want to distract you from Ukraine. Like, so there was like that aspect of it as well. I'll be honest, I thought it got a little ridiculous because at one point I think CNN put out an article being like how to talk to your kids about the slap. <laughs> and I was like, all right, now it's just gone. Are you serious? Like, calm down. Yeah. I'm like, do you know, like, yeah, they're getting slapped every day violence. in school, like, at, you know, with the cut of the welfare child tax, like, come on. Yeah. yeah I mean, it's, it's true. I'll be honest with you. I, 
I am still not 100% convinced <laughs> it wasn't staged. You're a slap I know a lot of people are going to say, I don't know. But listen, I'm, I'm an old school wrestling Black fan. Denier. Um, shout out to my man Sean Blackman, uh, also a lover of wrestling. And listen, and fam, you. There, there, there were moments where you you could wonder. I mean, you know, they do a good job. And so ultimately, you know, I don't know. The, the one of our later guests today, actually, VJ Prashad, shared a amazing meme <laughs> that is like analyzing the body position of both of them. <laughs> and it does seem like Chris Rock may have been braced. A little earlier than one might be braced if it was a complete yeah. shock to you. So I, I, God, I don't know. I mean, there's just a part of me that feels like something about this feels like it's just working. I mean, like it's working. Look at the fact that we're talking about it here. And, you know, is anything a coincidence anymore? I don't know. So I could obviously go either way. I mean, I could see, you know, from the comments that Will made himself later. You know, at a certain point, people are always making jokes out of, about you. Chris Rock had actually already carried them in 2016 at the same award show that maybe you just said, I'm going to do something this time. I don't know. But I don't know. I, I see the thing on the bottom. That's Jesus. a really I funny mean, I lower think... third, yeah. <laughs> 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 Hashtag slap game I mean, was an inside job. Yeah. That's good. I don't know who wrote it, but it's I good. mean, I, I like it. I like it, too. Shout out to the Breakthrough team, always. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I, I mean, I think too, like, how do we actually dramatize our movement like mm. this? Like, what are some of the ways that we can like come out and, you know, like say, what are the five fingers say to the face? To like, you, you know, you, Ron so should I be concerned or, that you're you going to come in here and slap me in one of these shows unexpectedly? <laughs> that you guys will work on that Depends behind the what scenes? You say. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Can I just say, can no. I just say when, it comes, when it comes to Hollywood, I'm like a Hollywood truther. Like, I think everything is stage managed. Like, I don't believe that many, most of the marriages are real. I'm not joking. Like, most Hollywood marriages are yeah. like publicity and PR agreements. That's why people get like married and divorced a thousand times. Cause like their age, it's like arranged marriages, kind of like, yeah, loyalty. right. I'm being serious. I'm being serious. Not in all cases, but in a lot of cases, like a lot of what we see, the picture that we get of people's lives are totally stage managed publicity stunts. So I wouldn't be surprised if this was a publicity stunt on some level, though, I don't know like how it benefits Will Smith. <laughs> but I mean, that's, that's why I really think like I, I, that's why I'm into the slap gate. Okay. Like I'm a hashtag slap gator because it also, but also like the body positions, it doesn't seem like, have you ever, you know, anybody who watches like boxing, like Will Smith is a big guy and he's had training. Cause he's been in a lot of movies where he's had to use certain kinds of training. Like he knows how to buy, he was like Muhammad Ali. I'm just saying the guy knows how to slap. I'm sure. Like if he was really going to slap Chris Rock, Chris Rock would like, there would be like a kind of like, you know, oh, like if you, you know, you know what I mean? I just, like you just, you just like, remind me of Maybe every... it's one of those. <laughs> no, go ahead, Tia. <laughs> maybe it's one of those things where it's like you're doing it and it's kind of happening in slow motion and you're just kind of like, should I, should I? But your hand's already there. Like maybe he had some sort of something consciousness that. that kicked in and then he was like, ah, oh, you know, F it. <laughs> I'm already here. Shout out to I Martina mean... Hernandez for your thing. But I have to say, Rhonda, you sound like every actor after they do a movie boxing, they're like, yeah, you know, I was training with Larry Holmes and he was telling me like, I I could have been a boxer in a different life kind of thing. Like, no, you I, couldn't. I'm not, saying, I'm not even saying that Will Smith is like a professional boxer. I'm just saying if he slaps someone like that, Chris Rock didn't even react. He just got like, so there was like a thud sound and he was like, whoa, was professional. that was like it. That was it. <laughs> He's a professional. He ate it. It was just kind of weird. <laughs> well, as Judd I mean, Apatow said, he could have killed him. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I mean, I mean whatever. I, I stand by what I said. I'm not taking it back. <laughs> <laughs> Eugene looks surprised. I, you know, not to, not to get all serious, but I am here, and I do have a little bit of time. I was just talking with someone earlier about... Uh, Muhammad Ali, actually, who, you know, Will Smith played in a movie and got his boxing chops, apparently. <laughs> but, like, you know, Muhammad Ali's, 
I was talking to someone today about like developing leaders and I know I'm sort of switching a little bit, but I think there's so many conversations that are happening right now and opportunities for us to like engage with folks and see who's talking about what and how they're talking about it. And I find some of my like leadership development like comes from like Muhammad Ali's uh, coach. He had this thing where he would never tell Ali when he was doing something wrong. He would always just, you know, sort of encourage him and just sort of engage him and build that trust and have those conversations. So just thinking about in this moment, like, how are we identifying folks that are having like a conversation that, you know, like we can actually engage with them in and like build with them and bring them in so that we're not like just squandering this opportunity, but using it in a way that we can actually pick up, you know, the masses of people who are just like, either like, what does this have to do with it? Or like, oh yeah, like, let's get out and and do something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. I think it's a good point. It's sort of like, you know, how do you take what's given to you and make something, it's sort of a lemon lemonade kind of thing, I think is what you're saying, is that obviously when you have, we talked about this with the Judas and the Black Messiah when you were on, sort of we don't control the production of these things, but once they're there and it's once it's a conversation and everybody's talking about it, you know, the everything's political as they say. So there is a question of like what we take from this. Well, before I let you go then Sierra, you tell me what, what is your takeaway from the conversation uh, that you would want somebody who's maybe not as politically active, but just talking about this, what would you, what, what uh, parallels would you draw? I don't know why I have a pencil in my hand. Sorry. Well, yeah, I would actually talk to people who are politically active because I feel like that's the base that you have. Um, mm. A lot of folks who are like, you know, getting conscious or who are conscious and actually like fighting and struggling. So I guess I would say this a takeaway is just like, don't be that person who is like shutting down these conversations and is just like, well, you know, blah, 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 you know, like. How do we, again, just like use this to actually build relationships, um, I think is like the key takeaway. And how do we as revolutionaries like use this moment to like identify where the class is, like where folks are in the mental terrain, like what work do we need to do um, to like take people just that one step further? Like how do we engage? Um, I mean, yeah, I, I actually have a, one thing that I would like to pub. So, um, and folks might know with the poor people's campaign, a national call for a more revival. Um, we are planning a, a national gathering in Washington, June 18th around the issues of systemic racism, poverty, ecological devastation, militarism, and, uh, sort of like the distorted, distorted mer- uh, narrative of white Christian nationalism. And in preparation for that, for folks who are in New York, we're actually going to have an art build. So if you want to get creative, if you want to engage in the terrain, maybe you could make a poster with Will Flip Smith smacking the ruling class. <laughs> um, come out. Uh, we'll be at People's Forum this Saturday, 1 to 4, uh, in preparation for a march on Wall Street, April 11th. Um, and we'll be gathering at 4.30. Um, Putin and the slap. Hmm. How do I tie in the Ukrainian? I don't really. Honestly. Yeah, there's a lot there. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot there. I'm gonna tell you what. I'm gonna I'm gonna let you ruminate on that. We're gonna bring you back on the connection between Will Smith uh, and perhaps Bel Air and Ukraine and Putin. I actually yeah. <laughs> I saw an amazing Venn diagram, but we're not gonna go there. Sierra Taylor. I was gonna. I don't know if they're ready yet. I don't know if they're ready. They're not ready for that. They're not. Uh, Sierra Taylor, (laughs) as always, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us here on the show. Thank you, Sierra. Thank you. And Rania, stay stay tough out there. I know you will. Um, And shout out to the break. Thank you. Love (laughs) y'all. Right yeah, there, there's honestly, I did see someone made a Venn diagram (laughs) tying Putin, Will Smith, (laughs) and something else together. It was. Quite that funny. is going to be an interesting conversation, but we're not having it tonight. <laughs> I know. Well, we'll always be here. We have a lot going on. Of course, this is, again, why you should subscribe to our YouTube and hit the bell for the alerts. You yes. never know 
what we might be talking about. I don't even know if this is set, so I'm just going to throw it out there, and if it doesn't happen, blame it on someone else. But for fans of Bad Vegan, get ready. There could be some interesting, very exclusive content coming here on Breakthrough News. If you liked it on Netflix, you might want to take a look, but we'll it's coming Ooh. soon. Oh, uh, nevertheless, okay. subscribe, hit News the bell. Me. That's what you want to do. Um, well, we're actually going to turn to someone who I've already mentioned on this show tonight. That's Vijay Prashad, the executive director of the Tricontinental Institute, who himself is engaged in a little conspiracy over the slap. Vijay, thank you so much for being with us. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be with you. Thanks for having me. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry we have to talk about things that are not exactly slap worthy, but no, this no, no. is really worse than a slap, what we're going to talk yeah. about, I think. It's way, way yeah. worse. It seems like it's only getting worse. I mean, you know, one of the things that has obviously been a big theme this week is the the growing ripple effects from the massive sanctions regime and from the war itself. Biden spoke at a press conference today. He is now calling all of the economic challenges happening in the United States, quote unquote, Putin's price hikes. But obviously we're looking at hunger. I mean, I know <laughs> you've been writing a lot about this, VJ, but it does feel that, you know, now as we get into the second month, really more of the story is starting to become that all around the world, there's some very serious challenges starting to emerge. Well, you know, um, there's no doubt that the question of fuel prices and food prices is going to be the dominant theme uh, for most people outside perhaps Europe and North America, where the focus is still on the war. Um, I interviewed people in Central Asia um, around the president of Kazakhstan, for instance, who gave a State of the Union address last week um, in which he basically called for reconstructing Kazakhstan's food sovereignty. Um, Kazakhstan, uh, Turkmenistan, these Central Asian republics are going to be hit immediately because their economies are yoked to Russia. I mean, that's a normal uh, situation since they are right bordering Russia, landlocked countries which rely on Russian ports uh, for the exit of their own energy uh, resources. When they sell energy to the world, it goes through uh, the ports in Russia. And so they have been hit terribly hard. You know, uh, the, I was told in Uzbekistan, 65% of an average person's bill, their income goes to food. This is going to increase by five, six percent. That's catastrophic for people. It's catastrophic. COVID inflation combined with Ukraine inflation is going to create chaos across the global south. Yeah, you know, VJ, I think I mentioned this when we, you and I talked a few weeks ago on dispatches. Shout out to dispatches. Um, but the, you know, we talked about the the ripple effects uh, on the global south, and I mentioned that just being in Lebanon you know, the uh, price of ga of oil has already risen. And it was already so expensive here because the government reduced subsidies. And I'm not suggesting that the Global South is in a position to handle the coming crises better. I don't think the Global South is in a position to. But I think it's going to really shock the Global North um, because usually the Global North is quite, because it's the imperialist core, is quite immunized. Uh, from these sorts of shocks. But when we see what's happening with Russia saying that you have to purchase our oil and gas in rubles, it looks like the Europeans are saying no to that so far. Uh, there's, you know, I'm hearing from my family in the US that the price of everything had already gone up pretty dramatically even a month ago, even two months ago. And now it's increasing even more. We're he hearing about price hikes in Germany. What do you think this is going to do to politics? in the global north because you're talking about economic recessions really that are affecting the average person uh, in ways that n none of the governments of these countries despite how wealthy they are seem to be willing willing to even foot the bill for i mean they weren't willing to foot the bill during covid really especially in the us um and they seem to be telling everyone that well freedom has a price and the freedom, you know, <laughs> that the freedom that we have to protect from Russia, I guess, is the price of you have to pay a lot more money for everything. How do you think that's gonna, that's gonna, you know, how, what are the consequences going to be on politics in in Europe and the U.S.? Well, in the United States, there's actually a little more room uh, for maneuver because the U.S. is largely um, food secure. You know, 
food imports, especially things like wheat and so on, are not a big part of the average person's bill. There'll be inflation, but that inflation was largely due to the COVID supply shock. You know, that's why the food uh, price of goods was, had gone up before. The United States is also fuel um, sufficient. In, in other words, the United States is going to be relatively cushioned from this. It's Europe that's going to be hit hard because Europe relies on um, Russian natural gas and oil, for instance, not only for fuel, but also as an input for fertilizer, which means long-term food production in Europe is going to be damaged. Um, Europe relies on grain supplies from Ukraine. I mean, between Ukraine and Russia, 23%, roughly, maybe a little more, of world grain supplies come from just these two countries. Uh, you know, you talked about Lebanon. In 2010, there was a drought that struck Ukraine and Russia and, and various other countries, but the drought in Russia and Ukraine was severe. Many people looking at those uh, two droughts, conditions in those countries, suggest that the so-called Arab Spring, one of the spurs of it was the drought of 2010. In fact, people in Egypt were on the streets saying, bring down the price of bread. Um, so mm -hmm. I think that, in fact, Europe is going to be hit pretty hard. And, you know, it's, it's a question that Europeans need to ask themselves, Rania, which is, look, you know, you're allowing yourself to become the doormat for the ambitions of the United States. Um, you know, U.S. President Joe Biden has said, well, we're going to just open up the spigot of the strategic oil reserve. Well, that's all very well. How are you going to get it to Europe? He says they're going to sell liquefied natural gas to Europe. You've got to build new terminals for liquefied natural gas. That's not created out of Legos in a day. That's going to take years to construct. So, in fact, in the short term, as now, Europe is going to continue to buy energy from Russia. And eventually, they are going to have to come to an agreement. It could very well be that in the end, they don't insist on a ruble scheme, but they might come up with some other scheme, a barter scheme or something. It's not going to be the case that uh, these countries can pivot so quickly. In fact, the Chancellor of Germany told Mr. Biden, if we ban Russian natural gas now, we will go into a catastrophic recession. That's pretty strong words from a German Chancellor. You know, Vijay, I, I think what you're saying there about the question Europeans are asking themselves does sort of remind me of sort of maybe a broader piece of this whole thing, which is, I mean, the need to reconsider how we live, you know, almost as a species on Earth. I mean, you look at so many societies that we saw this with COVID, too, you know, the lack of resilience, the, you know, the, the intense income inequality and all these other things that are bad in and of themselves. But then when these major shocks and crises happen, it just becomes supercharged. And, I, you know, it seems to me like this, if as much as any other time, I guess, the, to, to reflect on and, and perhaps act on what the, the implications of that are, that we can't just keep going the way things have been going as a world. Well, you know, right after 1991, Eugene, there was a big push that came from the World Bank in particular for basically food market liberalization and globalization. In other words, to allow food uh, production all over the world to be integrated. And, you know, four to six companies began to dominate the world food market. Six multinational companies dominate the world seed market. Uh, that form of globalization earned lots of profits for the big corporations. It also, to some extent, increased food production in some uh, particular crops and so on. There are some advantages to these complementarities. You know, can't entirely dismiss it. What it meant was, Eugene, in the middle of the COVID pandemic, when supply chains were disrupted, it was a wake-up call because integration was all very well. But once the supply chains began to collapse, integration is a nightmare. And that's why you have president of Kazakhstan, you have presidents in, um, in Africa talking about, you know, I mean, I was quite struck by fairly conservative presidents in West Africa talking about the need for food sovereignty, not only food security, which is a Treaty of Rome phrase, but they're using terms like food sovereignty. And, you know, it's one thing, Eugene, you know, when the United States attacked Iraq in 2003, 
there was a problem because um, oil from Iraq went offline. Well, at that point, Saudi Arabia could just pump more oil out of the ground. And Saudi Arabia became, in a sense, the insurance policy. Uh, when you attack or sanction an oil country like sanctioning Venezuela, Saudi Arabia is always available to pump more oil. You can't pump wheat out of the ground. You can't pump rice out of the ground. You can't just bring, there's no country that provides you know, insurance for food markets. So I think it's going to raise, and it is not going to, I'm sorry, it has already raised serious questions among poorer countries in particular about becoming more food independent, less dependent on the supply chain. And, you know, this is a horrible period. Wars are terrible. This is a terrible war. But if that's an outcome from this, I think that could be very useful for the world because 2.7 billion people were struggling with hunger before this mm. war. The number will rise. And I think we need to put hunger as the number one issue uh, for human beings as we go forward. And, and I think this is a wake-up call for many countries. Yeah, you know, on that note, VJ, it does seem like there is something major shifting right now um, in the sense that you have so many countries around the world, despite the fact we keep hearing, you know, the international community stands against Russia, the vast majority of the world has actually abstained from really taking a side here. You can see that with the refusal to join in the sanctions, which, you know, is really just the US, Europe, Japan, Canada, Australia. The rest of the world is much larger than that, both in population and just geographical size. Um, but, you know, while we kind of see even client states of the US in the global south kind of refusing to take a side here, there just seems to be so many calamities taking place at the same time. Like we have this oil shock and this financial shock and this cold war and this hot war. Do you, you know, maybe this is too big a thing to say, but does it seem to you like there's a kind of system that's that's collapsing right now? Um, even if that collapse is going to be a long one and a painful one, it does seem like something is coming to an end. Well, to be honest with you, Rania, I think that the unraveling started a long time ago. I mean, the Iraq war of 2003 was one indication of unraveling. It was major overreach by the United States. You know, now the uh, press, New York Times and others are talking about, um, you know, the Russian army being bogged down, unable to take Kiev, overreach of Russia. I mean, I've read this story before, um, but not in the New York Times. <laughs> I read the story, story in al -Akbar. I read the story in the Indian <laughs> press during the war uh, in Iraq, when the United States had a very difficult time um, you know, in a sense, not only capturing Iraq, you remember that war went on for years. I mean, you have to include the two battles for Fallujah and so on. Um, that war went on for years. It wasn't just weeks. And even weeks, you remember when the troops left Kuwait, they were bogged down in a sandstorm for, for I think, I think it was over a week. The, the sandstorm stopped the, the transit. So the United States bombarded um, Baghdad with the heavy artillery from the skies, which is bombers and so on, and cruise missiles, terrible, violent bombing of Baghdad, all forgotten now because the press is basically focused on the Russian bombing of, of, of Ukrainian cities in a way as amnesia for U.S. bombing of mm -hmm. other cities. But I don't want to get into that. The point I'm trying to make is this unraveling was from Iraq, from the war in Iraq, from the financial crisis of 2007, from the emergence of um, the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, we're in the middle of a lot of shifting around. But I don't want to exaggerate the situation at all. Um, this is a moment of deep contradictions. You know, a country like India is actually excellent here. India continues to be part of the US policy of encircling China, part of the Quad with Japan and Australia and the United States. India continues to be in the quad. So that's on the one side. On the other side, India has a very complicated relationship with Russia. The government does not want to condemn what the Russians are doing in Ukraine. Um, it's not because India, it's not only because India imports um, large amounts of its defense equipment, what is known as defense equipment, but basically war machinery from Russia. 60% of India's uh, military imports come from Russia. It's not merely because of that. It's also because 
India is keen not to see, and this is my understanding from talking to people in the external affairs division in India, people are keen not to see um, a conflict with a major nuclear power escalate out of control. Uh, people are very scared of this. You know, yes, there have been previous wars, the war on Iraq and so on, but the war on Iraq in 2003 did not include two nuclear powers, you know, um, which might get into even a so-called accidental clash. Now, India and Pakistan have been to war with each other since both have had nuclear weapons. That's true. Um, they both tested nuclear weapons in 1998, and then they went to war in 1999. Very bad timing, fellas. Very bad timing. But fortunately, <laughs> yeah. that was an engagement that took place in the Kargil area uh, in Kashmir. It was contained, fortunately, it didn't escalate out of control, but it could have. And many of us were very worried at the time. So I think there's a, this is a moment of great contradiction, not clarity. I don't think we can say, you know, we're moving from a unipolar world to a multipolar world or anything like that. I think that's premature. We are at a time of great um, motion. I'm not sure which direction it's going to go in. <laughs> You know, the reason I hesitate from saying U.S. unipolarity is over, Rania, is because the U.S. still has 800 military bases around the world. It still has a forward policy that no other country can match. Recently, the mm. Solomon Islands, just, you know, a couple of days ago, decided to sign an agreement with the Chinese. This is a very significant development because it's China's attempt to break away from this first island chain that the U.S. is setting up in the Pacific to encircle the Chinese. United States has basically built a wall around China. Uh, just because they signed one agreement with the Solomon Islands doesn't mean weakness in the U.S. military posture. We can't let our eyes off the fact that the United States continues to be the most powerful and aggressive country in the world. Um, and they are not going to let any new world order appear without a major fight. These are very, very dangerous people. Mr. Biden might somehow sometimes sound incoherent, but he's a very dangerous man. No, I think that point is very well taken and notable right after that Solomon's Islands, Islands deal in Australia. The whole thing became, should Australia invade the Solomon Islands to check China? Well, Vijay Prashad, as always, Deeply appreciate having you here. Tricontinental putting out excellent things on all of these issues, including on hunger, but appreciate some of your very valuable time here on the Freedom Side. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot good. there. There's a lot to it. I, I tend to agree with what Vijay is saying, that it's a time of great contradiction, not clarity. I think that, yeah. you know, there, I mean, it's fine to have strong opinions, but I feel like there's so many people who are carrying on one way or the other on either side who act like they know everything yeah. about everything and they can predict everything about what this means and whether it's good or whether it's bad from their point of view, perhaps a little, you know, humbleness in our, our predictions and thought processes Indeed. are warranted. It also kind of feels, it kind of feels like an unsettling moment because there's no clarity. Like we mm. don't know where everything is going it, and it's feel things just feel like they're collapsing, which is mm -hmm. never, you know, it's never... Uh, no, I hear you, but you have climate yeah. change, you have yeah, the like, idea yeah. of nuclear war, and not only the idea of nuclear war, but right. even just how quickly, you know, Biden during the uh, primary, the Democratic primary, I'll say this and then we'll move on, had said in response to this question that had been posed to Elizabeth Warren about whether the U.S. would do a nuclear first strike, and Biden, of course, said that he would not do a nuclear first strike. So, of course, this was a, this is a relatively big development because the U.S. has always yeah. reserved the right to strike first. Yeah. And then just, I think it was earlier this week or into last week, he was asked about this and he indeed said, we reserve the right to strike first. So, I mean, we're entering a realm where so many forms of legitimate destruction of humanity and many other yes. species on earth, we're staring down the barrel at it. It's a frightening moment. It's a frightening moment. And it's like unsettling because nobody knows and every, it, and, and it's, you know, we're at a stage in human history where we have the capacity to just, well, we don't, but you know, there's people yeah. who have the capacity to destroy the world. And so anyways, so that's a depressing note. Yeah, <laughs> it is a depressing, depressing note, but it's an important note. one. A lot to yeah. think about, I, you know, Vijay's yeah. thing about hunger. I've been thinking more and more about that old uh, Charlton Heston movie, Soylent Green, you know, which is like about 
I don't even know what year it is in Soil and Green. It might be 2022. <laughs> but, uh, you know, what, the, world, the impact of a world hunger crisis in a capitalist world, it, much could be said about Soil and Green, but apropos, sadly. Well, we want to move to, you know, some other uh, aspects of the sort of broader global context of what's happening in Ukraine. We want to turn to the issues rippling around China and its role in the world. Very honored to be joined with us here on the show, John Ross, who's a senior fellow at the Chongyang Institute at Rinmin University in China, also an award-winning columnist with several media organizations. Mr. Ross, thank you so much for being with us. Very pleased to be here. Well, the first question I have is, in a lot of the Western media conversation about sort of the impact of the, the the war in Ukraine on China is, well, you know, China has good ties with Russia, but they also had good ties with Eastern Europe. The Belt and Road was sort of tied into this, so that this is sort of an existential crisis for China's sort of broader, quote-unquote, global ambitions. And I'm wondering what you think of that framing in terms of the impact on Ukraine, uh, on China, rather, of the war in Ukraine. Well, I, I would like to first make one point because I've got a slightly unusual perspective on this because I, in addition to working at a Chinese university, I lived in Moscow from 1992 to 2000. Hmm. Um, and I was frankly surprised by the war. Uh, the, whatever was the political view, Paul, in, in Russia, I knew, and from people who were pro-Western through to other anti-Western, they, they thought that the NATO was a deadly threat to Russia if it was in Ukraine. Right, let's go to your China question, right, okay. Ch China does not have global ambitions in that sense. It's not trying to uh, displace uh, the United States or anything like that. What it's trying to do is it's trying to make give the people who live of China a good standard of living. As that's 1.4 billion people, that has a consequence that if the China becomes a if they have a good standard of living, China will become the biggest economy in the world. And this is unacceptable to the United States. And the only the United States has already lost the economic war with China, uh, particularly for unipolar polar one. China's economy has grown much more rapidly. The US economy is now only 16% of the world economy. That means 8% of the world economy is outside of the US. The only even if the United States re retains overwhelming supremacy so far, or is, uh, but in the nuclear field, it doesn't even have overwhelming supremacy in that because the Russian nuclear forces are a match for the United States. So mm -hmm. China sees the situation as that the United States is attempting to prevent the people of China having a decent standard of living, which means they have to keep China poor. And there was a big military threat to that. And that's why China has emphasized such questions as the advance of NATO is very, very desperate for the whole world, including for China. So it's not only that the, uh, China is attempting to do anything. China is just attempting to defend itself and deliver a good standard of living for its people. But it understands that the advance of NATO against Russia has big negative consequences for that. On the flip side of that, I'm curious, you know, you mentioned that you were surprised by this war. I think we all were, you know. No, um, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't. No, no Rania, oh. I said I was not surprised. Oh, I'm sorry. I misunderstood. Okay, then you were one of the few who wasn't surprised by this particular war. I think there a lot of us were kind of like... This, I mean, even the Russians were making jokes about it. I think a lot of Russians were surprised by it. But that said, um, there's been... A kind of like in the Western analysts, the Western analysis of China's position on this has been that either A, China greenlit the war, or there's been the flip side of that, which is that, oh, China's very upset by this war and the U.S. is trying to peel China away from Russia. I'm curious if from the Chinese vantage point here, if this war could be seen as more negative than positive, or if in a way, in the sense that, you know, uh, starting this war has like changed the global economy, caused all these sanctions that might impact China if China continues to do business with Russia? Or does it actually end up kind of giving China a view of what sanctions from the U.S. might look like and kind of giving them well, an upper hand in that sense? How do you think that the well, Chinese or the Chinese government, I guess, is viewing this? I think that the Chinese government uh, would not necessarily have chosen 
the methods which were adopted by Russia to deal with the question in, in Ukraine. I don't believe, therefore, the Chinese government in any way gave some sanction for this conspiracy theory. But it also understands right. what is the reality of the situation. It understands perfectly well that what the United States really wants in Russia is regime change. And I that, don't I just mean about Putin. They want a return to the situation which existed in the 1990s when the government of Russia under Yeltsin was completely subordinate to the United States. Uh, and uh, any form of government which stands up for the independent interests of Russia is unacceptable to the United States, whether it's led by Putin personally or by somebody else. Um, and that this is, of course, a very great threat to China, because it would mean that the United States would be on China's northern, uh, a government controlled by the United States would be on China's uh, northern border. Uh, and the present time, China's nuclear forces are not equal to those of the United States. They can impose terrible suffering on the American people. They can kill tens of millions of people, if in the worst case, in the United States. But they can't completely obliterate uh, the United States, whereas Russia can completely obliterate the United States. Its, its nuclear forces are the equivalent of the United States. And therefore, the, in the situation, the good relations which exist between Russia and China are a protection of China against the aggression by the United States. Uh, China is very well aware that it, it knows the United States when it tried to bring U Ukraine into NATO was the line, as they put it, of the of Russia. It was perfectly conscious. This is a new escalation. The United States was previously prepared to attack much militarily weaker countries, Yugoslavia, uh, Iraq. Uh, this time, the United States was prepared to carry out a co consciously confrontational policy with a nuclear armed state. That is a qualitative escalation of the US. Mm -hmm. Then secondly, the US is trying to nibble away at a red line of China, which is the one China policy. The United, this has been the basis of uh, relations between China and the United States, uh, Nixon's famous visit uh, to Beijing in 1972. And the United States has deliberately sought to undermine um, such things as inviting uh, the, the so-called Taiwan government to Biden's inauguration, uh, sending higher and higher delegations there. And therefore, you have a, the China is aware that the United States is attempting to cross the, the red lines of a very powerful state, Russia, and it's also simultaneously attempting to cross the red lines of a, another very powerful state, China. So this is a this is very dangerous escalation mm. of aggression uh, by the United States. You know, one other thing uh, thing I've been wondering about, and certainly curious your thoughts on, is this issue of so-called secondary sanctions. Of course, the United States has been sort of I don't know, sort of intimating that if China, you know, quote unquote, does too much to help Russia, that, you know, they'll also be in the crosshairs. But I mean, that seems like quite a, a, a dangerous road for the United States, because, you know, if China is more aggressively sanctioned by the United States, they will be forced to retaliate. But so much of the U.S. economy is deeply tied in with China. That feels like a strong leverage point there uh, to at least some degree, have a bit of a hedge against the U.S. attempts to punish them for continuing to, to trade and work with Russia? Yeah, so the United States, if you had peaceful competition with China, that's just economic competition, the United States would lose. Uh, that's why the United States is tempted to use military means. Let's just take the last two years of the pandemic. During the last two years, uh, the U.S. economy grew by 2.1%. Uh, that's taken the two years together. And the Chinese economy grew by 10.5%. That is, China's economy grew five times as fast as the United States. And the United States, if it engages in an economic war with China, will lose it. And therefore, this, throw, this, this therefore poses a very great danger. There was a notorious statement made by the German chief of staff, von Moltke, in 1912, which is, in which he said, war is inevitable and the sooner the better. This is frequently used to show the bellicose character of Germany, et cetera, et cetera. But actually, it was very rational. At that time, both Russia and the United States economies were growing more rapidly than Germany. Uh, and if there was going to be a war, therefore, the sooner the war took place, the better from Germany's point of view. It was, it was a rational calculation. 
this is the danger which exists for the United States at the present time, that having lost the econ its economic supremacy, we can discuss whether the Chinese economy is, is actually already bigger than the US economy or is still a bit behind it or whatever. And certainly in certain technological fields, the United States still has the lead. But the United States is losing in peaceful economic competition. And therefore, the very great risk is that it will turn to increasing military uh, action. That's what is the path of escalation that we've seen over the last uh, start more than 20 years. And the Chinese government, I'm very sure, is very aware of this situation. And therefore, it knows that the uh, not this threat of expansion of NATO, which is what has really caused the war in, in Ukraine, is, is a big threat to China. It's perfectly capable of doing those rational calculations. I'm sure it does. Yeah. And then, you know, when we think about the the role of China in all of this, you know, China has tried to step in as sort of like a mediator. And China actually does have a very big trade relationship with the Ukrainians. Do you see a role for China uh, in helping to mediate this conflict in any way? Or is it seen as too one sided? I don't think that uh, this is this is my interpretation. I mean, I've, there is a big debate in China on this immense mm. thing. I mean, in the, to give you an, art, an, art, an example, I wrote an article on Ukraine published in Chinese. It had 500,000 hits in less than 24 hours. And I'm not the biggest author in China either. That's just to show you the, the, <laughs> that, that's just to show you the level of interest, right? OK, oh. uh, unless unless there was a desire of. of Russia and Ukraine for China to play a mediating role, I don't think it would wish to step in. What it would like mm -hmm. is it would like a peaceful solution to this situation. Um, I'm sure that the position which is put forward by the Russian government and which is now long last being accepted by Zelensky, that uh, Ukraine should be neutral. I'm, I would think that that would be very much in line with what China's government would. I've got no private information on this, but a, a ra this would be a rational calculation for what it wants. But I don't think it's not going to try to insert itself into the situation. Other people are playing that that mediating role at the present time. That would be my view. Mm. You know, I, I wonder, you know, one thing that's also been discussed is, is, you know, is this a big opportunity for China in a way in terms of filling the gaps vis-a-vis -vis companies that are now fleeing Russia from the West, I guess pretty much every Western company, con yeah, every Western company fleeing uh, the country of Russia. Whew, sorry. Uh, you know, it, how do you view that? I mean, is China in a position, I mean, obviously they have big deals in certain areas, but are you expecting a lot of Chinese companies to sort of rush in and fill the breach here or would they even be welcome in Russia from some of the uh, Western companies that seem to be walking away from their investments? The, the framework of China is that China wants to get in with peacefully building its own economy. I don't think it likes a war going on. Um, and on the other hand, it understands all the military aspects that I've explained at that time. Will Chinese companies uh, take advantage of uh, sanctions against Russia, etc., to build up such a Russian uh, to build up their position in Russia? I would imagine so, yes. There are reports that, for example, uh, Chinese smartphone sales are up several hundred percent um, in in Russia now. But that's, it's not the main thing. R Russia is an important but you know, Russia is, uh, China is the world's biggest trading nation. It has much greater trade even with the European Union or the United States or even ASEAN than it does with Russia. So, it will take advantage, I would assume, take advantage of any business opportunities, but it's not pursuing an aggressive policy of attempting to create an opening for itself. And I would think that overall, as I said, its judgment is that the war is a bad thing. I'm curious what you think about the way that uh, so far these really unprecedented sanctions against Russia have, have been dealt with. When we look at the, the kind of global reaction to sanctions, you see the vast majority of the world abstaining, um, mostly the global south, but the global south is a huge majority of the world, uh, including China, of course. And that has certainly helped, I, I think, 
you know, not immunize Russia from the impact. Obviously, this is going to be very destructive for Russia's economy. Um, but it definitely makes a difference when you have a huge economy like Russia's when a lot of the world is not going to play into the sanctions. What do you think that means for China? Because China is a way bigger country than Russia. It's, I think, way more integral to the world economy in so many ways. If I'm China, I've got to be like looking at this and thinking like, we're not sanctions proof, but we have ways to get around what I, you know, what seems to be America's favorite weapon at the moment in terms of the way it deals with its adversaries. Well, certainly, if you look at the trade war, that Trump law, the quite clear conclusion we can all arrive at it is the United States has lost it. Uh, if we look at China's increase in exports and imports uh, in the first uh, two months of, of this, they're up over 20% both compared to 2020 and well above the levels in 2019. Um, the Chinese exports and also its uh, import market is booming. The uh, Has there been some damage to China's exports to the United States? Yes, there's been a bit, which has been paid for off the price by the U.S. people, the sanctions again, not the sanctions, the tariffs against China are costing each U.S. family several hundred dollars. It's done a bit of damage to China's trade to with the United States, but the China's economy is so powerful, as the figures show, that it's been easily over, able to compensate for these losses in the United States and in other parts of the world. As I said, if you look at the last two years, it's just come through it very, very much better uh, than the United States. So that's why the United States the, it doesn't really want to engage in peaceful economic competition with China, because when it does do so, it loses. Yeah, no, very well taken point. And it'll be interesting to see how all of this shakes out in the context of the ongoing war. John Ross, really appreciate you being willing to join us. Also, just have to mention your book, China's Great Road, which you can get from 1804 Books here in the United States. But thank you for giving us some of your time here on the Freedom Side, Mr. Ross. Very pleased to be here. Mm -hmm. Well, Rania, I think Ooh. very well taken <laughs> points. You know, I, I was thinking about this issue of uh, what he said about how the U.S. has lost the, the war with China. Yeah. I was thinking about this the other day because I was reading an article about how Turkey has built some, I think it's the world's largest steel factory. I don't know if that's true, but it's a huge steel factory. And it's running off of all renewable energy from solar wow. panels on the roof of this giant factory. The solar panels are all set up by Huawei, who, because they've been blocked <laughs> from all these other things, has now pivoted to all sorts of other smart technologies and has created this, like, I don't know, some technology that helps optimize and move around all the different solar panels to make sure it gets a lot of power. And I just thought, wow, I wow. thought that they were crushing Huawei two years ago, um, but now it seems they've pivoted uh, to, to another very wow. lucrative uh, area. Are you suggesting, Eugene, that sanctions are green or encourage <laughs> green innovation? Because <laughs> that's what I took out of that. That is what I took. No, no. But to, in all seriousness, that is that is actually like really interesting and really and I I really believe that as awful as everything is right now, the you know the U.S. is kind of doing this sort of self destruction. Uh, it has no choice. Like just like people say Russia had no choice, maybe like to, I don't know if that's true, but you know, people have made the argument Russia had no choice. They had to do to go to war uh, because it was like NATO was coming for them. In a way, the U.S. has no choice but to carry out these like self-destructive maneuvers mm -hmm. because like John just said, the U.S. can't beat China uh, in a fair way when it comes to economics. So it has to like go out of its way to sanction things but at the end of the day there's like a blowback from that um especially Huge. that's like amazing if huawei turned it around into like okay we're just gonna put so sol solar panels on steel factories yeah. that's actually kind of incredible yeah they're definitely <laughs> making a big move to the internet of things huawei is a very interesting company and that's a, that's a whole other issue but uh, there's a lot of interesting things to learn i think about sort of corporate governance in china from huawei yes rania well, I thought this would be a good opportunity to remind people, because we didn't do it at the beginning, mm. that we are almost at 100,000 followers on YouTube, mm. um, which I'm really excited about. I, I want to reach. I don't know. It doesn't mean anything. It's just a nice big round number, and it adds like a it six Well, digit. it does mean something. <laughs> it means yeah. that we have 100,000 oh, yeah. fantastic followers of Breakthrough News. Right. 
Right. It's a milestone too. It's like a milestone. Like we we're building this channel. We have work, we put a lot of hard work into it. So it's like nice to see it growing. So that said, we're a few hundred away from a hundred thousand. So if for some crazy reason you haven't yet subscribed to breakthrough news, now is the time to hit the subscribe button and to call up everyone, you know, and even if they've never heard of Breakthrough News, tell them to hit the subscribe button. We promise so we they hit won't that hundred thousand. Yeah, I know it's a little time. I know it sounds a little weird. Just call up your mom and be like, "Mom, <laughs> hop onto YouTube and please look up Breakthrough News and hit the subscribe button." Please. It means the world, but no. Honestly, I, I, <laughs> if you call your mom and ask her to subscribe and she subscribes, that's like, I, I don't know, you don't get anything for that, but you will you will gain my eternal respect for going above oh, and yeah. beyond the call of duty. Uh, that is not a bridge too far. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> and then also on top of that, um, also, if you want to support us beyond just subscribing, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash breakthrough news. Uh, and while we're getting the plugs in, you can yeah. also uh, subscribe or subscribe. Is that the right word to our Telegram channel? Yes. There we go. Uh, join our Telegram channel. Subscribe to it. I'm not quite sure the lingo yet, but one of those things is accurate at Breakthrough <laughs> News. Um, and then, of course, if you are watching this live, you can always throw money into the super chat uh, and we will try to we will thank you on air. We'll get to it. We almost yeah. always do. I think and technically sometimes you we'll join. Leave the a telegram channel you join that's I like the little button okay. on the bottom when you look at it when you hit like the the button but at, you join I subscribe like disconnected. sign up people know i sound like someone's disconnected father i'm like hey subscribe <laughs> to the youtube uh, telegram tiktok <laughs> there's nothing I mean, wrong with being that person by the way that, well and we're on youtube telegram and tiktok so you can tell yeah. your disconnected <laughs> relative that yeah. if they can ever figure it out <laughs> They can follow us on all of them. Uh, <laughs> on the same name, at the same name, at Breakthrough News, right? People are saying some funny things to me here about what you could call it. Assimilate our Telegram channel. That's one that I've gotten here. Uh, so <laughs> I like that. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> but yes. Futuristic. Telegram. Get on there. Uh, and <laughs> at BT News and across all your social media platforms, breakthroughnews.org. So we are everywhere, as it were. Uh, but yeah, no, I think this is an important issue. I mean, both what John and VJ were bringing to the forefront, I think, is that you know, pretty much all the various contradictions of society are coming to a fore. And I think there, you know, VJ said this relative to, to Europe. I think that, you know, what John is saying is very relevant to, to people in the United States is, you know, who is it really benefiting to have these, you know, Cold War style policies towards China, you know, be pushing the NATO right up to the border of, of Russia and, you know, nuclear saber rattling going on. I mean, given all the challenges that we face, as a world, as a species, certainly as a country, you know, who is it really helping? Which one of those problems is any of this stuff really solving? And I think when you drill down on that, you'll find that it's it's basically none of them. It's not solving any of the problems. In fact, it's only exacerbating them. You talk about climate change. You know, this conflict and the sanctions that have come from it are now setting back climate change in a massive way because everyone's trying to produce more and more oil to try to take advantage of the fact that the market, uh, you know, now has certain challenges introduced into it because of the, the, the conflict, among other things. So, yeah, it's a. Uh, I'll tell you who benefits. Well, there are there are there are some people who benefit. No, no, I yeah. mean there are. Those are the Lockheed. people who sit on the like executive board, right? That was actually first thing that come to mind is Lockheed Martin. All of these weapons companies, the entire like you know the entire national security state. Uh, of the U.S. All, I mean, it all exists to serve American oligarchs at the end of the day. Um, yeah. Yes, our oligarchs. And that's yes. who this benefits. That's who this benefits is these oligarchs in the global north who want to maintain their imperialist control and hegemony over the world. And that's what all of this is about. That's what the NATO encirclement of Russia is about. That's what the encirclement of China is about, is trying to maintain imperialist to Germany. Yeah. Uh, and it's, you know, and the, the more, you know, resistance to that, the more they fail, whether it's in Afghanistan, whether it's in Syria, whether it's in Latin America, whether it's in, you know, in China and Russia, mm -hmm. the more that they fail, the more that they're going to kind of like push back violently and harder. And that's what VJ means when these people are incredibly dangerous, they are incredibly dangerous because 
you know, they will, it's like, they'll take the world down with them if they have to They're, They, you know, the U S is not going to go down without a fight. Uh, yeah. and that's what it's doing right now. And it's just going to get more and more dangerous in the way that they behave in response. Yeah, well, something to think about when people are thinking about what they want to act and what they want to do and who they want to vote for and all these various pieces. But I'm glad right. you brought up the issue of U.S. hegemony because we want to turn to the issue of Latin America, where, of course, U.S. hegemony has been massively challenged since Hugo Chavez's election in 1998 in Venezuela. But, of course, Colombia, the Israel of Latin America, has remained <laughs> as the cornerstone of these hard-right, neoliberal, racist politics in Latin America. But perhaps... Things could be headed for a change in Colombia, and we are very happy to be joined yet again by friend of the show, fantastic journalist, co-editor of People's Dispatch, Zoe Alexandra. Welcome, Zoe. Great to be back here, as always. Well, you know, this is, the pleasure is all ours, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you cheat. You know, I don't really I, get that joke, to be honest. For, I'm going to keep making it. I don't care. All right. Um, it is a pleasure. I'll fill but, you, you know, in. I'll fill you in. A later. lot happening in Colombia, of course. Uh, <laughs> let me not assume that people know. Maybe let's start here. You know, obviously there's primary-ish elections. We're now in the official campaign for elections for president, but there's, I think, other activity going on. Give us just a sense of what the political scene is, is like there and, and when these next elections are and what people should be looking for. Definitely. So uh, two weeks back, the um, first round of the kind of electoral process in Colombia was held uh, a legislative election elections and the primary elections for the different um, political coalitions. Um, and so in this, uh, people were able to vote for who's going to represent them in the, in the Senate, in the House of Representatives, and also who they wanted for, uh, within each um, coalition, who would be the presidential and vice presidential candidates. This also kind of serves as a litmus test of how much support the, the, that these um, coalitions have. Some pe many people drop out after this first round um, as presidential candidates, seeing if they don't have enough votes, they join to other coalitions. So it's a really important moment. Um, and in this first uh, electoral phase, uh, a surprising new, well, not really surprising, but a new electoral force was one of kind of the, the stars of this day, which is the historical pact. This is a progressive alliance, a coalition of many different parties in Colombia, led by uh, presidential, now presidential candidate Gustavo Petro. He is a, a longtime um, political activist in Colombia. He was active with the um, 19M movement. Uh, which was an arm movement in Colombia in the urban centers. Um, he then, uh, with the transition, with the demobilization of this group, he entered institutional politics, um, was active in the legislative realm. He was the mayor of Bogota. He's been a senator for the last several years, and he really has galvanized um, left forces and progressive forces in Colombia that have long been uh, divided, that have long been, you know, suffering campaigns of persecution. Um, Gustavo Petro has emerged as the front runner. And in these, um, in this primary election, he, you know, received millions of votes. He's going to be the presidential candidate of the historic pact. And uh, the historic pact not only got a, a large number of uh, seats in the, in the Senate, in the Congress, um, but also had a really strong showing in these primary elections. And it looks like they are, you know, leading the voter intention and voter uh, support for the upcoming presidential elections. The first round, which will be held in May, um, and if one candidate does not get over 50% of the votes, they will go to a second round in June, and then it will be between be between the top two candidates. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, one other notable aspect, sorry, that I just want to get to here that I was hoping you could speak to about the primary is the emergence of Francia Marquez as the running mate of Petro, which is also quite historic. Yeah, Francia Marquez was the um, second uh, runner up in this internal primary of the historic pact. She is an Afro-Colombian land defender, activist, human rights defender, an incredible, uh, you know, person who has really been in the struggle for, for decades. Um, she comes from a region of Colombia that's one of the most affected by violence. Cauca. Um, she was really active in her community in resisting an illegal mining project. She walked all the way from her town in Cauca to Bogota, demanding that the authorities take action um, for the destruction that was happening of her community. The, you know, 
assassination of people in her community. Um, she has long been, you know, active in Colombia's diverse and plural social movements. And she's really emerged as kind of the representation of these movements that have so long been shut out of institutional politics that have been annihilated, assassinated, um, repressed, persecuted. And it's giving a lot of incredible energy, really. I mean, people that have been so sidelined, you know, historically for decades, for for centuries, really, Afro-Colombian communities that have been so oppressed and so marginalized. And to see that a woman like Francia Marquez, who comes from Cauca, who's an Afro-Colombian woman who fights for the rights of Afro-descendant communities in Colombia and across the continent, is now the front runner in these presidential elections is incredibly historic. I mean, the historic fact in its name, it really, it's, it's not a lie, it is historic. It's bringing together so many sections of the left, so many sections of Colombia's movements, of the society, and it really stands a strong chance in these upcoming elections. You know, Zoe, in Colombia is this country that is so deeply connected to the U.S. in terms of its security apparatus. I mean, even more than that, but the U.S. basically trains its armed forces, uh, its police, which are known to be incredibly violent. There is a lot of uh, killings of activists uh, that we hear about taking place in Colombia on a regular basis. So I'm just curious in terms of the safety of these people. Is there is there a danger in the kinds of rise of these figures uh, uh, in a place like Colombia, where we do see a lot of violence, not just, of course, like the killings of uh, of activists, but also, you know, we saw there was an uprising in Colombia not too long ago, and the reaction to that uprising was quite violent. So what could be the backlash to figures like this uh, gaining ground in a place like Colombia? I mean, already we've seen it. So uh, Francia Marquez was only confirmed as the vice presidential candidate, you know, in the past week. And since then, there has been an onslaught of threats against her. Um, she's received several death threats. And, you know, this is not new for her. I mean, essentially, if you enter into activism in Colombia, you almost expect to get death threats. And especially if you are a prominent voice, she's received several from the uh, the group Aguilas Negras, which in recent years has been kind of ubiquitous. Anytime there's a movement, an uprising, the Aguilas Negras uh, will release a statement threatening, you know, many, many prominent people of death. She's received horrific, uh, you know, slandering campaigns on social media in actually mainstream media, Colombian media, racist statements, horrible, horrible things. And I think people are really worried about the, their safety. She's uh, personally asked President Ivan Duque that he has to take action to ensure her safety. I mean, right now, the fact that on Twitter, it's almost trending, the hashtag don't kill Petro really speaks to the fact that, you know, it's, it's, there's a real danger here. I mean, in, there is precedent for this. Um, uh, the member of M19, who was going to run for president after the demobilization, uh, was assassinated. He was the presidential candidate, Carlos Pizarro Leon Gomez, uh, he was very popular. He was coming out of this demobilized uh, guerrilla group and he was assassinated. There's a lot of precedent for this happening in Colombia. That being said, of course, this is not the 1990s anymore. It would be, I mean, really, I, hopefully this is not something that will happen. Hopefully Ivan Duque will actually take measures to ensure their safety. They, of course, have many different security uh, frameworks, but I think the fact that this is even happening, the fact that presidential candidate, vice presidential candidate is under such threats is really concerning and speaks to the fact that being a social leader, being a human rights defender in a country like Colombia means that your life is constantly in danger and not just from online trolls, but people who actually could come to your house and kill you, like has happened to so many people in Colombia. Mm -hmm. Most trade unionists killed of any country on earth regularly, year after year. Well, you know, I think this is a, a, a good sort of segue into, I think, an important issue is, you know, were uh, Petro and Marquez able to be successful? You know, what are some of their policies around certainly the peace process, but what are some of the other things that they're proposing and what would that mean for, for the nation of Colombia? So, you know, as Colombia being uh, Latin America's Israel, um, it has, uh, you know, not only is it dangerous to be an activist, but the whole setup of society is really, um, you know, made in order to favor 
um, the elites and exclude the majority. So for example, access to healthcare is extremely challenging in Colombia. There was a law passed during uh, the presidency of Alvaro Uribe Vélez, which essentially privatized many of the health services. So millions are left without, without health care. There's a famous kind of like urban legend of people dying in the doors of the hospital because they're unable to get um, health care. So one major uh, point of their platform is ensuring health care and nationalizing health care. Um, access to education. So when Petro was mayor of Bogota, one of the principal axes of his, uh, of his time as mayor was you know, democratizing access to education. He worked a lot with the homeless communities in Bogota. He worked a lot with these marginalized communities. People had not been able to have access to education and ensuring they were able to enroll in adult education programs. And in Colombia, again, the higher education is extremely expensive. It's extremely uh, inaccessible. People are now forced to take out huge loans or try to get lucky enough to get some insane scholarship. But democratizing access to education. Um, housing, of course, is another huge issue. So all of these essential rights are key tenets of the platform. And then, you know, even looking at the energy uh, sector, Colombia is, like its neighbor Venezuela, a huge exporter of oil. It has vast, vast reserves of oil. And this has been to its detriment. Um, it's a country that has uh, 40 per, over 40% of its territory um, in, in, in concessions to mining companies, to oil companies, and none of this wealth, none of this mineral wealth, none of this uh, natural resource wealth has actually benefited the communities. Um, it's a very popular country to invest in and to have mining projects in because of precisely the legal framework that um, makes these companies able to take out uh, these resources, not pay royalties, not have to have any sort of accountability to the communities, there's so much you could say more about their collusion also with paramilitary groups, but the essential fact that these resources have never benefited the people, have never been put into actually strengthening the state. Um, and so Petro uh, wants, one of his central proposals is moving away from this resource extraction economy um, and pushing towards agriculture. Uh, Colombia is one of the countries with you know extremely rich soil. You can grow literally anything there I've seen fruits I've never even seen in my entire life. And so he really wants to focus on this strength of the Colombian economy. Uh, there's a major challenge in rural communities is that over the past several decades, because of free trade agreements, because of the violence, because of the drug war, they've been forced to not grow vegetables, fruits, and other things that would sustain their communities and actually have kind of a positive um, effect, but they've been forced to grow coca crops, they've been forced to grow drugs. And so trying to address both this problem of national economic development and also strengthening of these rural communities that throughout the six decades of the Colombian armed conflict have been so marginalized, have been so persecuted, and today continue to face the, the you know, threats to their survival because of neoliberalism, because of um, all of these different policies against them. Mm -hmm. And Zoe, you know, not to make everything about Ukraine, but I think just to kind of go full circle here, I think it would be interesting just to know what is the, you know, you you pay attention to like the Colombian media and what people in Colombia are talking about. And Colombia is a very close state to the U.S. Um, that said, you know, it's not like they've taken an extreme position against Russia, as far as I know, in this war on Ukraine. And I'm curious about how that war is playing out at least in the way it's being discussed in a country like Colombia that is very much aligned with the U.S. but isn't necessarily trying to antagonize Russia as far as, far as I know. Again, I could be very wrong about that. Well, Colombia is a, a global partner of NATO, is actually the first of its kind um, to have this kind of relationship with the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And I say the full name because Colombia, of course, is not in the North Atlantic, um, but it is part of this uh, NATO global expansion. And so I think in the sense that, of course, uh, you know, Colombia doesn't really have that much to 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 send like European countries, they're not going to um, be having this more direct relationship. But of course, they fall in lockstep with the NATO orientations, you know, also by virtue of being uh, a global NATO partner. Um, I think there's a lot of attention right now on the elections and a lot of the mainstream media coverage mm -hmm. right now has really been focused on demonizing um, Petro. Uh, I, there's, they like to make a lot of loose kind of allegations. So you have here on one hand, Russia, USSR, communist, terrorist, Petro. So a lot of that, there's a lot of, uh, 
you know, these kind of loose word games. Um, but I think, of course, there, I think, you know, anything that can be weaponized to stigmatize a left, say that the progressive ticket is not a good choice for Colombia is definitely being done. Um, so all those kind of conservative talking heads definitely weaponizing the situation to further their own goals and to say that, you know, Colombia supports Ukraine and, and the, someone like Gustavo Petro is in bed with, uh, you, you know, the USSR, which of course <laughs> doesn't, is not, is not factually, you know, accurate at all. Well, also doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. I mean, there's also the yeah. fact that the USSR no longer yeah. exists. It's all, whatever, yeah. everything they can get in there. I'm sure the Castro Chavismo is coming back, but you know, so oh, it, yeah. it does remind me a little bit of, I guess every election now in Latin America, but you know, in Mexico in 2018, which was also sort of a major changeover in terms of the traditional politics and sort of a new era. We've seen Chile, obviously, uh, uh, with the recent election there. Uh, you know, perhaps we will see in Brazil the return of uh, former President Lula. I mean, given you were there in Honduras, of course, as well, it's a, obviously a huge uh, win for the left. I mean, give us a sense of what it would mean for Petro to succeed in Colombia for the region and and maybe what that means for the world. Well, I'll just leave it there. Well, I think, you know, starting off first with the, the most local level, which is what it would mean for Colombia. I mean, even the symbolic victory of Francia Marquez and Gustavo Petro triumphing in the country that has been ruled by the elites and the oligarchs for 60 years. I mean, in Colombia, you never had a uh, plan Condor coup because the left was never able, ever, ever um, able to gain power, was never able to break this kind of uh, lock that the oligarchy has always had on institutional politics in the country. Um, it, would, it would it would be huge. I mean, imagine a, a country that would have friendly relations with Venezuela that would not be allowing paramilitaries to train for, um, you know, magnicides to happen there, for invasions of the neighboring country to happen. Um, we're definitely seeing this progressive wave, this progressive tide. I think we've talked about it before, and this op opens up many opportunities for, you know, more interdependence within the region. Um, if Brazil, which is the largest country in Latin America and has over, you know, almost nearly uh, 300 million people, or also to, you know, win a progressive government, I think we're looking at a very different scenario. Um, it's hard to imagine how how the U.S. Uh, would respond to this scenario, but I think we've seen in, in, in some of the cases that with these, you know, left, less uh, Venezuela-style governments, you know, these are not victories of socialist parties. These are not victories that are, you know, really, really challenging um, the structure of capitalism. I mean, Gustavo Petro will say, I am not anti-capitalist. You know, he is not going to challenge the underlying economic structure in a serious way. And so I, I think, you know, for example, after Xiomara Castro won, instead of contesting her, her victory, uh, the U.S. knew it was more strategic to try to immediately make friends with her. Um, and, you know, to what extent they've been able to influence Honduran policy to the moment is, is unclear. I think we're going to see in the coming months and years, like how they're going to reconfigure their response to a region that's, of course, tired of neoliberalism, tired of hardline conservatism. And how will they respond to these progressive governments? I think, you know, Gabriel Boric not inviting Venezuela, not inviting Cuba to his inauguration. I think I'm willing to, to I'm hoping that, you know, Gustavo Petro, Francia Marquez um, government would be much more friendly, especially if I think the element that Francia Marquez is in this coalition is that she's representing the voices of the movements. This is not the same as Boric. This is not the same as, you know, other victories because she really does come from the movement. She's coming from the communities representing these voices. And that's, uh, you know, that will be really, really strong as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Zoe, as always, really appreciate you giving us some of your time. And of course, People's Dispatch, I could not recommend it any more highly and of course at 11 p.m eastern time tomorrow friday give the people what they want mm -hmm. do i have the time wrong a.m 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 what i say p.m <laughs> yeah. whatever it's so on youtube really you can watch it whenever you want zoe hey, vj person you do a great end. job every single week breaking down all the things you need to be hearing and talking about and everything was on 
uh, the world, really. 11 a.m., p.m., noon, whatever. Friday morning, it's there. It's on YouTube. You should watch it whenever you can. Thank you, Zoe. Thanks I appreciate so much you for having us. me. Great to speak mm-hmm. with you both. Ooh, when it's on I'm YouTube, positive. does it matter if it's 11 a.m. or 11 p.m.? I mean, if it's live, yeah. If people. It is live, people but like you can watch it after. Live. I watch it after. It's a great show. Or I, I am not offended. I am not. I don't. I don't. No one's offended that you said PM. It's okay because I think okay. it's eleven PM somewhere, right? It, right. <laughs> that's true, and it's a worldwide <laughs> show. Okay, people are joining yeah. from various parts of the that's world. True. They always exactly. do that show, no matter where in the world the host may be, which is you know have the same tip of the hat. I must say. Yeah. Yeah, I know it's amazing. It's amazing. I love it. I love the host. I'm so glad we got to have Zoe on. And I feel like that was like kind of a positive beat. Yeah, I I think it is. I mean, you know, obviously we're going to have to see. I mean, it's, I mean, as she said, even the hashtag don't kill Petro trending there in Colombia. I mean, we'll have to see if we even make it. It's very tricky circumstance. But I I think to have your name in. If what looks like is going to happen is going to happen, I think this could be huge for Latin America, really a game changer. And if you twin it with a win by the Workers' Party in Brazil, I think what Zoe is saying, there's a lot of different contradictions and challenges of all of these sort of pink tide countries. But be that as it may, I do feel that it raises a very new element into or back into this conversation on sort of the worldwide scale of where things are shifting because, and we've talked about this on the show before, Rania, I mean, I don't think that a quote-unquote multipolar world is an unalloyed good. I mean, there has to be some sort of poll that emerges, a social poll, if you will, a popular poll, if you will, that promotes a politics for a a different kind of world. And I think the movements in Latin America have been talking about that and and sharing their own proposals and thoughts and ideas for that. We, you know, you've seen the Alba Alliance put out the plan to save the planet. So there's all sorts of conversation and things coming out of Latin America that I think is extraordinarily relevant to the whole world and how we can move humanity forward. So this would be huge, I think, to have the main stumbling block to progress in Latin America, Colombia, to see these, 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 you know, narco dictators that run the country fall. No, especially in a country like Colombia, which is, you know, one of the most, I think, secure American, how it has been one of the most reliable American allies, one of the most right-wing countries, sort of like base of the right-wing in so many ways in Latin America for so, for so many years. And for there to be a shift there like this um, is actually really significant on so many levels. So fingers crossed. Yes. We're rooting for... Well, before we close, <laughs> yes, we are rooting. Lucia Bollock saying that if we get 100,000 YouTube subscribers, I'll sing the international. <laughs> I will not, but I not that it. I'm against no, it. No, now you have to. You yeah. have to. You I have know no that was never Lucille decided. But I mean, you know, I don't really need <laughs> that much to sing the international, just global working class solidarity. Uh, and also, uh, Macarius? Maybe I did not say that right. Anyway, shout out to you. Thank you for your donation. Really appreciate it. Saying great show so far. Thanking us for what we do. Macarius. Thank you I'm going for with watching. Macarius. What's that, Ron? I'm, I'm going with Macarius. Okay. That's what I'm going with. Respect. The name. Uh, either way, yeah. we're very grateful to you. Well, I think as always, Rania, that will bring us to a close for this week. You yes. know, thanks to all our guests. Certainly thanks to everyone who was watching us. Don't forget, we're now on Telegram. Well, okay, sorry. Well, Patreon too. Oh, there it is. <laughs> just a little head fake for you there. Just, um, you can shout join out social our media. Telegram <laughs> there at Breakthrough News. I think someone was going to maybe drop the link in the chat, so... Perhaps you can join it that way, but there it is, Telegram at Breakthrough News. We are also, of course, accepting your patronage at patreon.com slash breakthrough news, patreon.com slash breakthrough news. You can become a patron there. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube. Hit the bell so you can get the alerts. You can find us across all your social media platforms at BT Newsroom. We're also at breakthroughnews.org. So that'll do it for us this week, but Rania and I will be back with you next week. Thank you.